Hello everybody, Wet Haired Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start of my review of The Shadow Over Innsmouth and Other Stories of Horror by H.P. Lovecraft. So uh, I'll read you the blurb here, and then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs. The Shadow Over Innsmouth. To save his sanity, he must run from the teeming horde of alien and aberrant... To save his sanity, he must run from the teeming horde of alien and aberrant shapes. But where does madness leave off and reality begin? And are the monsters that pursue him his real problem? The festival. An uncanny, uncozy, unmerry Christmas story. The colour out of space. The great rock falls out of the sky and embeds itself in the ground, its heart a glowing ball of colour. After that, everything changes. A look into a future that menaces all mankind. Imprisoned with the pharaohs, a nameless, slithering, unmentionable horror stalks cloven hoofed through the dark cave of night. In the walls of Eryx, trapped in a building without doors or walls that he can see. The Earthman is in big trouble on Venus. The transition of Juan Romero. A Mexican miner investigates a mystery cavern and finds unnameable horrors and monstrosities in the abyss. The Outsider. He was an outsider, a stranger among those who are still men. And yet in his newfound freedom he can welcome the bitterness of alienage. A guided tour of the weird and wonderful worlds that inhabited the mind of Howard Phillips Lovecraft, the 20th century Edgar Allan Poe. Six macabre stories that will continue to haunt you longer after you have read them. I thought this was quite interesting. I've actually been writing some articles for a client about Lovecraft and cosmic horror and stuff. So this was kind of cool to read. Uh, as a boy, Lovecraft's health was poor and he spent most of his early years as a semi-invalid. His father died when he was three and after the death of his grandfather, he had only the company of his mother and his aunts. Perhaps because he was cut off from the companionship of other children by ill health, he began to dream of other, more interesting worlds. In his mind he saw vast unplumbed recesses of space that loom perpetually around our insignificant dust grain. In time these visions were to become the terrifying settings of many of his eerie tales. All my stories, Lovecraft once wrote, are based on the fundamental legend that this world was at one time inhabited by another race. For practicing black magic they lost their foothold and were expelled. Yet they live on out yet they live on outside, ever ready to take possession of the earth again. In his stories, this other race is called the Old Ones. Were they gods or demons? No, says Fritz Leiber, author and close friend of Lovecraft. The old ones were meant to be extraterrestrials, beings from outer space, according to Leiber, and most of Lovecraft's later tales are science fiction with a slight to moderate, with a slight to moderate supernatural dusting. So we start here with The Colour Out of Space, which was apparently turned into a TV movie called Die, Monster, Die. Um, but I found this really interesting because this is kind of similar to what's going on in um, my upcoming novel, Meat, which will be out shortly. Almost at the same time, the mortality among the livestock commenced. Poultry turned greyish and died very quickly, their meat being found dry and noisome upon cutting. Hogs grew inordinately fat, then suddenly began to undergo loathsome changes which no one could explain. Their meat was, of course, useless, and Nahum was at his wit's end. No rural veterinary... No rural veterinary would approach his place, and the city veterinary from Arkham was openly baffled. The swine began growing grey and brittle and falling to pieces before they died, and their eyes and muzzles developed as singular alterations. It was very inexplicable, for they had never been fed from the tainted vegetation. Then something struck the cows. Certain areas, or sometimes the whole body, would be uncannily shriveled or compressed, and atrocious collapses or disintegrations were common. In the last stages, and death was always the result, there would be a greying and turning brittle like that which beset the hogs. There could be no question of poison, for all the cases occurred in a locked and undisturbed barn. No bites of prowling things could have brought the virus, for what live beast of earth can pass through solid obstacles? It must be only natural disease, yet what disease could reach such results was beyond any mind's guessing. When the harvest came, there was not an animal surviving on the place, for the stock and poultry were dead and the dogs had run away. These dogs, three in number, had all vanished one night and were never heard of again. The five cats had left some time before, but their going was scarcely noticed since there now seemed to be no mice, and only Mrs. Gardner had made pets of the graceful felines. One of the things that I think Lovecraft does quite well is when he wraps up his stories, I just they tend to be generally pr uh, pretty well written, and here's a great example of that which I enjoyed. Amni would never go near the place again. It is 44 years now since the horror happened, but he has never been there, and will be glad when the new reservoir blots it out. I should be glad too, for I do not like the way the sunlight changed colour around the mouth of that abandoned well I passed. I hope the water will always be very deep, but even so I shall never drink it. I do not think I shall visit the Arkham country hereafter. Three of the men who had been with Ami returned next morning to see the ruins by daylight, but there were not any real ruins. 
Only the bricks of the chimney, the stones of the cellar, some mineral and metallic litter here and there, and the rim of that nefandus well. Save for Amy's dead horse, which they towed away and buried, and the buggy which they shortly returned to him. Everything that had ever been living had gone. Five eldritch acres of dusty grey desert remained, nor has anything ever grown there since. To this day it sprawls open to the sky like a great spot eaten by acid in the woods and fields, and the few who have ever dared glimpse it, in spite of the rural tales, have named it the Blasted Heath. So, um, this is the introduction I'm just going to read here to you for Imprisoned with the Pharaohs. Um, would you believe that this ghostly tale was really ghost-written? The great magician Harry Houdini dreamed up the plot and told it to the owner of Weird Tales, a magazine that specialised in stories of the uncanny. But telling a plot and turning it into a story are two different things, so Howard Lovecraft was hired to fashion Houdini's idea into fiction. It took him only a month to write the story, which was published under Houdini's name, and he seems to have enjoyed doing it. He wrote in a letter to a friend, I went the, I went the limit in descriptive realism in the first part. Then when I buckled down to the under the pyramid stuff, I let myself loose and coughed up some of the most nameless, slithering, unmentionable horror that ever stalked cloven hooved through the, ab through the abysses of Elder Night. The only problem is, I would argue that there sh yes, you can tell, well no, you can't tell that it's ghost written, but that's kind of the problem. Like, it just wasn't a particularly good story and I think you would believe that Houdini had written it because Houdini wasn't a writer. We get some stuff about Spanish patois as well. He, this guy, he goes, uh, he knew but a few words of English. While I found my Oxonian Spanish was something quite different from the patois of the peon of New Spain. I'd love to be able to speak French patois, but I can't even speak regular French yet. So we'll, we'll save that for later. So here we have Lovecraft's take on Christmas. It was the Yuletide that men call Christmas, though they know in their hearts it is older than Bethlehem and Babylon, older than Memphis and mankind. It was the Yuletide, and I had come at last to the ancient sea town where my people had dwelt and kept festival in the elder time when festival was forbidden, where also they had commanded their sons to keep festival once every century, that the memory of primal secrets might not be forgotten. Mine were an old people, and were old even when this land was settled three hundred years before. And they were strange, because they had come as dark furtive folk from opiate southern gardens of orchids, and spoken another tongue before they learnt the tongue of the blue-eyed fishers and now they were scattered and shared only the rituals of mysteries that non-living could understand. I was, the, I was the only one who came back that night to the old fishing town as legend bathed, for only the poor and the lonely remember. And, um, I mean, the guy could definitely write a paragraph, you know? So here's another great example, and this has some uh, Necronomicon in here. Actually, I will say that the idea of something being written by the mad Arab Abdul Al-Hazred possibly does point towards his problematic nature a little bit especially because I think he said it was a name he made up for himself when he was at school after he read the th a thousand and one nights so I mean anyway pointing to a chair table and pile of books the old man now left the room and when I sat down to read I saw that the books were hoary and moldy and that they included old Morister's wild marvels of science the terrible sadicismus triumphatus of Joseph Glanville published in 1681 the shocking de amina letrea of Remigius printed in 1595 at Lyon and worst of all the unmentionable necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul al Hazred why would you mention it if it's unmentionable in Olaus Wormius's forbidden Latin translation, a book which I had never seen but of which I had heard monstrous things widespread. No one spoke to me, but I could hear the creaking of signs in the wind outside and the whir of the wheel as the bonneted old woman continued her silent spinning, spinning. I thought the room and the books and the people very morbid and disquieting, but because an old tradition of my father's had summoned me to strange feastings, I resolved to expect queer things. So I tried to read and soon became tremblingly absorbed by something I found in that accursed Necronomicon a thought and a legend too hideous for sanity or consciousness, but I disliked it when I fancied I heard the closing of one of the windows that the settle faced, as if it had been stealthily opened. It had seemed to follow a whirring that was not of the old woman's spinning wheel. This was not much though, for the old woman was spinning very hard, and the aged clock had been striking. After that I lost the feeling that there were persons on the settee, and was reading intently and shudderingly when the old man came back booted and dressed in a loose antique costume, and sat down on that very bench so that I could not see him. It was certainly nervous waiting, and the blasphemous book in my hands made it doubly so. When eleven struck, however, the old man stood up, glided to a massive carved chest in a corner, and got two hooded cloaks, one of which he donned, and the other of which he draped round the old woman, who was ceasing her monotonous spinning. 
Then they both started for the outer door, the woman lamely creeping, and the old man, after picking up the very book I had been reading, beckoning me as he drew his hood over that unmoving face or mask. Wow. Oh, can we just shudderingly, shudderingly? That makes me shudderingly uncomfortable. <laughs> Another paragraph. This is what I mean with, with LovecraLovecraft. It's the, uh, the paragraphs that I'm amazed by and that I really enjoy. So there's another great paragraph here. Fainting and gasping, I looked at that unhallowed Erebus of Titan toadstools, leprous fire and slimy water, and saw the cloaked throngs forming a semicircle around the blazing pillar. It was the Yule Rite, older than man and fated to survive him, the primal rite of the solstice and of spring's promise beyond the snows, the rite of fire and evergreen, light and music. And in the Stygian grotto I saw them do the right, and adore the sick pillar of flame, and throw into the water handfuls gouged out of the vicious vegetation which glittered green in the chlorotic glare. I saw this, and I saw something amorphously squatted far away from the light, piping noisomely on a flute. And as the thing piped I thought I heard noxious muffled flutterings in the fetid darkness where I could not see. But what frightened me most was that flaming column, spouting volcanically from depths profound and inconceivable, casting no shadows as healthy flames should, and coating the nitrous stone with a nasty, venomous verdigris. For in all that seething combustion no warmth lay, but only the clamminess of death and corruption. I told you, he can write, he can write a paragraph, mate. Then we have a, a little, little quote from the Necro Necronomicon, I guess. The nethermost caverns, wrote the mad Arab, are not for the fathoming of eyes that see. For the marvels are strange and terrific. Cursed the ground where dead thoughts live new and oddly bodied, and evil the mind that is held by no head. Wisely did Ibn Sakab Wisely did Ibn Shahabo say that happy is the tomb where no wizard hath lain, and happy the town at night whose wizards are all ashes. For it is of old rumour that the soul of the devil bought haste not from his charnel clay, but fats and instructs the very worm that gnaws, till out of corruption horrid life springs, and the dull scavengers of earth wax crafty. And the dull scavengers of earth wax crafty to vex it and swell monstrous to plague it. Great holes secretly are digged where earth's pores ought to suffice, and things have learnt to walk that ought to crawl. Here in the shadow over Innsmouth it says, uh, Howard Lovecraft's father died in an insane asylum, and some critics think that this story symbolises the author's fear of tainted ancestry. True or not, the shadow over Innsmouth is also an adventure story, complete with a rousing chase scene in which the hero runs for his life and his sanity. But are the monsters that chase him his real problem? And so, yeah, this is the one where also my friend was like, well, it's also kind of about him not liking mixing between races. Although, it's kind of species too, so. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, but I didn't really actually have too much to say about that story. And in fact, it was probably one of my least favourite in the collection. Overall, I give it a pretty solid 3.75 out of 5, I reckon. Some of the stories were better than others. I did actually really like the festival. Um, uh, in Prison with the Pharaohs, I've read before and didn't like much. The Shadow over Innsmouth, I wasn't too keen on. The transition of Juan Romero, I thought was great. And the Outsider was pretty good. So, uh, make of that as you will. There we have it. That's what I made of The Shadow Over Innsmouth and Other Stories of Horror by H.B. Lovecraft. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.